Okay, this lesson for the Cornet Project class, I'll try to be more expeditious. I'll quote from text I've already had printed out. I've already filled some of the board with key points I'll make. The question is, why did God, uh, particularly, namely Jesus, who in the New Testament spoke about the city of Sodom, and why did God not want the Sodomites to repent? It's a real good question because I'll read the text, Matthew eleven twenty. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. So he's done most of his mighty works. These weren't, uh, I guess these were the ones that were most uh, powerful. So drop down to Matthew eleven twenty three, 23. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So Sodom would have repented. Jesus is now letting us know that God did not perform mighty miracles that would have caused them to repent, mind in association with him. Now that's not necessarily uh, that all of them, evangelically speaking, would have trusted uh, Jesus for everlasting life. It does mean that they would have minded in association with his warnings. So this is what Jesus said, but he said, I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So Capernaumites are worse than Sodomites because they didn't repent in view of or within the purview of Jesus' mighty miracles and works. And Jesus himself judged them by stating that Sodomites would have. So one, we notice it is a divine deterrent. It was a thing that discourages or intended to discourage someone for doing something. So any man, any woman, but man particularly in that particular text, from the time of the incineration of the city of Sodom, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to this day have a divine deterrent. So we now know that one thing he did it was to de deter others. So that's his love. Uh, and then, of course, his character, his holy, righteous character. God is love. God is light. God is life. So God doesn't want us in this lifetime, temporally speaking, nor eternally, obviously. But temporally, he doesn't want us to self-destruct by turning into going toward that. These people were not uh, created sodomites. They were not born sodomites. Uh, the law that says in Leviticus, thou shalt not lie with a man as with a woman. That was to the males. It was not to heterosexuals or homosexuals or whatever other identity they might had presumed to make of themselves. He told the males, and notice he used a woman as the uh, illustration or to demonstrate what was known by all rational beings. So when he said, you do not lie with a man, as with the woman, it was known, all the men knew what it meant to lie with a woman. So that was how a judgment by using the exhibit and the uh, knowledge that was known by all rational beings, men particularly in that covenant community, they knew what it was to lie with a woman. So he just applied that when God gave that instruction. But he didn't say, hey, you homosexual men in Israel, come over here, or you uh, heterosexual Hebrews come here. No, he's talking to the men, the males. So one is a divine deterrent. Second, covenant love. That refers to our right and privilege there unto appertaining. You can recall the kinsman redeemer. We know that from the Old Testament and the New, John 3, 16, particularly how he provided. Uh, Jesus gave Jesus the only genetic son, monogenetic son, so that the ones who were already believing, and that was so that Anyone who read the Gospel of John, heard the Gospel of John, or were taught the Gospel of John might thereby be persuaded. And also blood avenger, remember in the book of Revelation, recall that, where the souls under the altar who had been beheaded were crying out, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? You can go back to the Old Testament, the avenger of blood. So God is the avenger. That's a privilege in the covenant. Uh, deliverance of just lot from self-willed, self-imposed pain. That's mental anguish with the knowledge of potential physical harm. I noticed the report on the news now is uh, judges 
just judges, for example, just righteous judges are now have their homes surrounded. And all I could think about was the people surrounding Lot's house. And what's self-evident to all is the imminent threat physically to follow through with what they've already caused mentally, namely uh, anguish, a torment, mental torment and anguish. So we also have uh, de divine de de deterrent, the covenant love and the rights and privilege there unto appertaining, kinsman redemption, blood avenger, both sides of the same coin, deliverance of just lot. This is all part of that covenant love. And then according to divine discretion, this is God's ultimate infinite wisdom. The Bible speaks of the word discretion. It talks about his understanding in Psalm 147, 5 being infinite. So we trust that he would know uh, what would be best as a deterrent to save more lives, protect more people, and to prevent this condition of degeneration uh, of what we once called degenerates. But we, you, a male can degenerate to such a lewd and base conduct that they even then go on in that lewd and base conduct. You can read in Romans first three chapters of how bad things became before the flood, but men came to the point where they no longer considered it a worthy thing to retain the full knowledge of God in their minds. <clears throat> Therefore, because they did not consider it a worthy thing to retain the full knowledge of God in their minds, God turned them over to an unworthy mind. In English, it's reprobate. So reprobation, uh, they weren't created that way. They weren't predetermined that way. All that's just another distraction. Uh, that's what happens when people refuse to retain the full knowledge of God in their minds. Now let's go over here. Uh, just Lot judged justly, cross-reference Genesis 19.7. It says here, And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. And they said, that's 19.7, they were telling, he was warning them, don't do so wickedly. Remember, they were wanting to assault the messengers who came to warn Lot and then to remove him from that city. And the negotiation had already occurred where if there were so many righteous people there, would God not spare it? So Lot's now making an appeal to them. And verse 9, Genesis 19, 9, they said, stand back. And they said, again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. He's an outsider. And he will need to be a judge. Now will, he, now will we deal worse with thee than with them? So the messengers that they were uh, in very predatory posture towards and ready to physically assault them, sodomize them, it says here, we will now do worse with thee. Then with them, and they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to the, came near to break the door. Now what Lot did was what the law had said. It said, "Do not lie with a man as with a woman." So he used the the Bible, God inspired the Bible, used the woman to demonstrate, so that he could make it clear what was self evident to all rational beings, particularly men, knew what it was as males, for a male to lie with a woman. So here, Lot brings out his daughters, but he's doing it as a judge. Offer of the daughters is to say that I know what you want to do with these messengers. And they got it because it says that we will now do worse to you than with them. So Lot indicted them. They got the message. They didn't repent. They resented. And if you've ever taught, pastored, implored, fathered, there have been in a position of authority, you have uh, experienced the difference between people who resent and people who repent. Uh, several over my decades of pastoring, let's say the pathologically uh, inclined ones would come in and when I would instruct them on what would be uh, proper and right, uh, I would tell them before the conclusion of the council session that now you'll either leave here as one who resents or repents. And one man actually, it was so amazing. I'll, I'll always owe him for this. It's an honorable thing to be able to recall someone in such a stupefied mind. He said, I resent that. <laughs> I said, of course you would. So uh, you have to remember, this is talking about degeneration, mind being turned over, and circumstances certainly not being conducive. So now we have knowledge of Lot 
judging justly. We now have reports on our news. It's just amazing how this is the first thing I could think of. These people are now surrounding the houses of just judges, inflicting mental anguish, mental torment upon them with the implication and potential of physical harm. And it's just amazing that this is the same type of posture that people uh, did in Sodom who refused uh, or the Capernaumites refused to repent and the Sodomites were still wondering why did God forego doing the uh, mighty miracles so that they would repent. So in 2 Peter 2, 7, Lot was being completely caused to have pain by the conduct of the nullifying ones in a negation of morality. Now, this negation, we've talked about it. It refers to the function of negating, like in this case, negating morality intentionally. These nullifying, they nullify the implications of law, the uh, effect first, deterrent of the law as the sword of the state ordained as mentioned in Romans 13, that it was designed to deter. Uh, you remember fear, and if you do right, you have no reason to fear. Then they're nullifying the rights and privileges that Lot had, and as the covenant community day, the members of God's covenant community, for example, the new covenant community, the ecclesias today that have been here since the time of Christ and his definitive kind of ecclesia. Well, in that ecclesia, there are rights, privileges there unto appertaining. Our kinsman redemption is that in which we rejoice in our blood avenging. Uh, the work of the blood avenger is that in which we're secured and confident. We have hope of deliverance. We fled for 2,000 years. We have inalienable rights here in the United States, for example, which is quite ironic at the people who are targeting things that are the very core features of the covenant love of God, deterrent that's intended to save lives, and then, of course, all according to his divine discretion. So let's move back over here. They're negating morality. They're without morality, and they will, one, continue to be beyond any hope of having morality. So that's another insight to God's knowledge and insight of their hearts. And 2 Peter 2, 8, for with a look and by a report, and I just mentioned reports on the news, the just man who was dwelling among them, day out from day, they were tormenting his just soul with unlawful works. He just couldn't take what he continued to hear, what he continued to see, and they were quite uh, persistent. Uh, years ago, there was some kind of boycott of Disney World. There's now another controversy, but the Southern Baptist Convention boycotted or initiated a boycott against the uh, Disney World. Something about gay days or something. When they dragged me in the conversation, I just said, well, there's, it's against the law for public display of affection. That applies to males and females. It doesn't matter if they pretend they're heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever they want to say they are, pansexual, whatever the words are that they continue conduct in public was the same. So what did someone identifying themselves, quote, as gay have to do with their presumption to expose themselves in public? And that then nullified their argument because how would you know gay days were going on at Disney World, except you might notice two people of the same sex more familiar as far as sitting together and you not, but otherwise, what would they do publicly that would indicate broadcast or that you could look at. Well, in this case, that gay days, and there were multiple incidents where they were just simply acting uh, immorally, had nothing to do with gay or anything. They were being immoral, openly, doing openly that which was against the law and should have been deterred. But their defiance, is correlative with their lifestyle. So not only did they go down there because it was gay days, whatever that meant, but how would you know unless you stop and tell your child, oh, the two men walking together, your child wouldn't have noticed, but they didn't do that. They went down there outlandishly, wanted it to be heard and seen. They wanted the report of it. They wanted the ability to display it, exhibit it. So that was quite an indictment that you notice these correlations. So now you have people there. So let's go to this word here. It says, uh, made him an example, or made Sodom an example. 
Let me go. I lost my page here. I'll get that out here. And then I wrap it up because we're hitting my target mark. And it says, um, yeah, an example. I dropped the wrong page. Here we go. Yeah, made an example in sample, 2 Peter 2, 6, making them an in sample. In sample, that's the King James English word. That's hippo, dek, mimi, from these two words. It says to exhibit under the eyes, literally, as you would notice, all this is legal language. Exhibit A, your honor, as I just demonstrated the uh, foolish folly, uh, uh, foolishness of gay days at Disney World when no one was interested in pointing out that what they were doing, regardless of their homosexual identity, uh, was public display. So this was with a look. They wanted it to be seen. Now here they have been made an exhibit under the eyes to exemplify, that's instruct, admonish, show, or forewarn. So God did this by incinerating them. He saved countless number of lives since then. And we can all rest and, re and be assured and comforted with his intention of providing a divine deterrent, his faithfulness to covenant love, to extend this right and privilege to remind us that he's the kinsman of the redeemer, the blood avenger. He's our deliverer from self-willed, self-imposed pain, mental anguish with the knowledge of potential figures of harm, and all that's according to his divine discretion. So when he uh, decided and judged the holy, righteous, holy, holy, holy God decided to incinerate, it was for the good of the many, many more multitudes, perhaps millions. We could even, you know, go even further. But it, it was all there intended for that. So uh, for Capernaumites to be in a condition, uh, let's say, more degenerated than Sodomites, because the Sodomites, according to the revelation of Jesus, of the truth about what God, what they would have done in association with God, they would have minded in association with God had the mighty works that Jesus did in Capernaum been done there. So God's discretion, which is always above ours, his ways are above ours, His, but because he loves perfectly. And ours is always skewed and flawed. If we don't go by the scriptures. If we don't support what they say. So this is really good. I, a, uh, a tell you, tell you, who has made comments before, he directed me toward this, uh, these core features that give us a rationale for understanding why God did not want the Sodomites to repent. Because, you know, we often hear people quote the text, who will have all men to be saved. Well, that's true. He wants all men to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. That's referring to regenerated men in the ecclesia to then be delivered from their ignorance and be, have, be conjoined to the full knowledge of the truth. So if you're a pastor and you read that in the pastoral letters, you're very encouraged about the fact that you've been entrusted the highest responsibility for those who have trusted Jesus Christ for everlasting life and been fathered out from God. You, they're now entrusted your care to teach them and by doing so deliver them in this covenant love, this deliverance from ignorance and conjoin them with the reality of full knowledge. So. This is really good. This is wonderful. And uh, it's certainly encouraging to know that all of this that we think was a horrifying act, we hear people characterize it and even slander God. It's because they, God is love. They aren't. We aren't. The lives God saved, the homes he saved, the futures he saved, and then ultimately when you read the first three chapters of Romans, how degenerate it had become before the flood. And then since then, and God removed 90% of the lifespan of 100% of humanity. And in my flesh, it's hard to be grateful for that. But in my mind, that's free to serve God. I exult in his wisdom and discretion in reducing the thousand year lifespan to 100 years. So by 90%, Psalm 90, it's very mathological. So have a blessed day and read this, look at it. But this is why God did not want the sodomites to repent because he loved too much 
He loved too much. He loves, I'll just say not too much, but he loved more than the act to perform mighty works there so that they would have repented. That's what I'll say. He loved more than the act to do mighty works there then would have accomplished than what he did by not doing those mighty works. Okay, so they negated morality. They were without morality and they could come to the point where they would not be able to attain it. They would nullify the implications of the law. They would ridicule the command to not lie with a woman, not lie, lie, not lie with a man as with a woman. They were enraged when Lot offered his daughters to do just like the law had taught him. He was a judge. He judged justly. He showed them that he knew full well by the presenting of exhibit, an exhibit of his daughters, that I know exactly what you're wanting to do. They then said, not only do we know that you know what we're going to do, but now we're going to do worse to you. So this is very good, and you have a blessed day. Enjoy this lesson.